morning for those online. Uh, I wouldn't start this talk without making first a small tribute to a good colleague and friend who unfortunately passed away uh, two weeks ago, as you heard at the introduction. Uh, so he always used to laugh a lot at some of my stupid jokes, so I hope you will not mind that I have put some in the upcoming presentation. So next slide, please. Ah. Oh. Okay. Uh, so my presentation is also about uh, fair principle, and we noticed a lot discussing with the community uh, that sometimes uh, many confuse the concept of open data and fair data, because data can be fair, but not necessarily being open. And this is also very important when we speak about sensitive data. And often we also think that in biodiversity we don't have data that needs to be closed or restricted and uh, that everything can be open. So let's see if uh, that's really true. Uh, so what's in an acronym? So my colleagues from GBIF like to say that the European Open Science Cloud that speaks about fair data didn't really invent something because GBIF was already fair before the term even existed. So following a bit on what Tedwick is doing, they changed their logo and the term European Open Science Cloud has disappeared and EOSC is more and more on the way of becoming just a name like Tedwick uh, without that the European Open Science Cloud is spelled out much anymore. And why is that? Because they looked what they are doing. Is this really still open science? Their original aim was to make scientific data and push it as much open as possible over all scientific domains, so much more than just biodiversity. But then how do you define scientific data? Because even administrative data or personal data, if anybody in the world decides to study it, it becomes scientific data. So basically any data you can think of can become scientific. And of course, there can be issues with the law and sensitivity on this data to make them completely open. So the EOSC moved more and more to something that seems more feasible to do the data fair, but speaking less and less of open data. And their motto became uh, very early days already, as open as possible, but as close as necessary, because realistically they find out that it's impossible to push, to have everything open. Next slide. So at the last symposium of the EOSC, I had the um, task to have a debate how will you finance and sustain in the future EOSC plus all the research infrastructure that exists, not only in life science, but also in other domains and data spaces, both in Europe, but also worldwide infrastructures that have data from Europe alongside other data. And the dream of EOSC is to make talk all these infrastructures to each other in an operable way. So it's like taking GBIF and multiplying it by thousands. So really there is a discussion, is this even achievable? Uh, in the session on sensitive, uh, sensitive data at the EOSC symposium uh, two weeks ago, we had an interesting presentation by the EGI Foundation where they suggested that they should approach something called the five saves to build trust between the countries and um, institution to share data which is other, that is fair and reusable, but not necessarily open when there is really no other way. And they ask, uh, have the concept of safe projects, safe people, safe settings and safe outputs with uh, each time recommendation on how to achieve that. And then we had a presentation of um, Norway uh, colleagues who are building a so-called uh, trusted research environment where they do a secure data archiving and secure processing environments 
to build trust between the countries and also initiate that researchers or institutions that sometimes for good reason cannot be completely open, can still be interoperable and work and actually use the data like we do uh, for open data. <laughs> so uh, what now about biodiversity data? So can all biodiversity data be open? Probably not, being it for legal reason or sometimes for moral or ethical reason, even if by law you can make them open, you maybe have moral reasons for not doing it. For example, endangered species locations, uh, notions of access of benefit sharing, when permits are needed uh, for the Nagoya Protocol on genetic resources, or if there are regulation on personal data. Because colleagues always say, yeah, but the scientists publish and uh, they are already out there and open, so they should not have any problem with their personal data. But we forget that now doing more and more citizen science and also bring in the public and other stakeholders, these people are not scientists and these people may not want their personal data to be out there. So if you want to collaborate with these communities, you also have sometimes to pay more attention on personal data than it would be with scientists that are very happy to be cited and don't care if their personal data are out there. And then cannot open biodiversity data be fair? Yes, and they remain useful in being fair, even if they are not completely open because the metadata is still findable for most of the cases. They can be accessed and reused, even if you need a permission. And if they follow good standards, they can also um, be accessed and reused, even if you might need to have to pay for it and they are not freely accessible. But of course, it brings more challenging and complication if you want to have them really interoperable and if you want to automatize some systems because the machines may not really know what they have to do and uh, also uh, the people can become confused with all these rules. So what can we do in principle? In practice, uh, we have already seen sessions and presentation that Tadwick can play a major role by defining standards for the terms of uses and have controlled vocabularies. Uh, and for example, Arthur Chapman had uh, a session yesterday where they really uh, looked into this kind of standards. And this could then enable to have clearer processes, both for human and machines, on how to handle scientific data as automatically as possible without putting too many barriers on uh, all these processes to reuse of data. Um, and in our community, we could look into implementing trusted research environment, looking at the Norwegian example. If you go look at the links I provided, you can see the whole presentation online that is open. And uh, then you can also look into trusted archiving and storage environment so that those who are reluctant put their data in such repositories in a good manner and then gradually are pushed to be more and more open. And there in Belgium, together with University of Ghent, we are busy implementing something called the Fair Vault. I wanted to do a demo this year, but it's not uh, yet completely uh, achieved and finished enough. So I hope that next year uh, I can present that with the colleagues. And uh, in the Meisel Botanic Garden, where I'm working, and also with other Flemish research institutions in the framework of the Flemish Open Science Board, we will hire a legal expert who will really help, uh, because it's not enough to have the technical environment. You also need experts in uh, the legal domain to help us doing this correctly. Uh, and then an ideal test environment could also be the bicycle project, who released recently the Biodiversity Knowledge Hub, which is a web platform who acts for integrate uh, a lot of fair and interlinked data from different biodiversity research infrastructures and networks. And they are also in the process to onboard this service into the, the EOSC uh, platform. Uh, and so this could be an ideal test to uh, 
continue to develop because both um, uh, bicycle and uh, EOSC are good in the F and A of FAIR, but more developments are needed in the E and R. So I would plead to continue and also with Tedwick to, to work on this. Uh, so to conclude, uh, some final geeky recommendations. So 10 years ago, I did a similar presentation about sensitive data and if we need controlled vocabularies. And I had put Gollum with his precious data as a metaphor, but I read the instructions to make presentation and sorry, Peter Jackson didn't answer me in time. So you will just have my cat that is okay, yelling my precious. And then I had also put Spock that recommended you to make, in spite of all these rules, your data still open and fair. So whenever you can, do it both open and fair and just do it not completely open if you are absolutely obliged. Here also Paramount Studio didn't answer me. So you will have my cat looking very carefully at the EU innovation days where they said the same recommendations. <laughs> Uh, and so uh, I just want to say thank you to my co-authors and my colleagues from MESA and also the colleagues in the EOSC Financial Sustainability Task Force and uh, other groups in Belgium that I sit for the Open Science, the set of e-publishing group where we are busy writing a paper on copyright for uh, data and how to handle this. And of course, the colleagues from the bicycle projects and Tadwick, because it's really brainstorming with these people that we uh, came up with discussing about this uh, sensitive topic. And I also want to thank uh, my sponsors that made it, uh, uh, that I could come here because it was quite expensive. So uh, with bicycle, Tadwick and uh, Disco Flanders. And, I thank you very much uh, for your uh, patience to listen to this. And if you have any questions, let me know. Is there questions? Yeah. Hello, um, Dan Baker from Cyro. It's a Really interesting talk. I, I wasn't quite sure in when you talked about the Tadwick standards need to be improved in this mm. area. Is there already formalization on saying whether a record is fully open or restricted or is there like a traffic light system because you might have something say where the localities have been rounded for, you know, uh, endangered species. So is there an easy way for someone looking at the mm. record to say that there's it's yeah. uh, you're being open about it being restricted. And yeah, well, in the existing standards like ABCD, there is at unit level and at data set level uh, good con uh, concepts to uh, say uh, the term of use and all the licensing. In Darwin Core, it's more at the level of the provider, uh, the submission that you can put uh, how you want to be cited and some licenses, but it needs uh, revisiting. Uh, especially for the controlled vocabularies and what you have to do. Um, because the, the world has evolved a lot recently with much more regulations and rules uh, falling on our heads and many things that are sometimes contradictory. And uh, so I think there is a need to, to look at it and also give more explanations to the users on how to do it. Yeah, because you might give them all the fields, but it's partial data still and it might not be obvious that there is still some restriction. Right? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. And one thing is also this is often data that is not within the database and that has to be added uh, at, at the moment of publishing or uh, a static information. And as I said, uh, Arthur Chapman is a long time working on sensitive data and GBIF has also published uh, several documents on how to publish and how to use uh, sensitive data. So there is a lot there, but uh, we need to, to continue to adapt to the new legislation and eti also a lot of ethical uh, re uh, rec uh, recommendations that come more and more our way that we can't really ignore. And it's really that machines can also understand what to do. I think to uh, humans to understand what to do, we have done already a lot, but for the machines to do it automatically, 
it's not that easy. Okay. Thank you. Well, any other question? Quickly? Or, online? or after? No, online version? Ah, mm -hmm. yep. There's a comment online uh, from Seng Suyun saying, thank you for your presentation. My work is related to run an ecological data platform in South Korea. And my work has a similar concern regarding the data about endangered species. So would you explain more about them? And I wonder global stakeholder can, uh, I'm guessing it's if wonder global stakeholder can participate in this project. Um. Yeah, for on the endangered species, it depends a bit uh, on which species in the country. The legislations that you should sometimes not show the exact location, and there are ways to blur it or to make it a larger area that are also been developed together with GBIF and others. We also have standards. Uh, now, my colleague said those who want to do poaching don't need us to find it. So for science, uh, it's always a discussion, should we put it anyhow? And we have good scientific data. And there are other papers where they find out that due to showing the exact location of, I don't remember, lizards and some islands, they were really disseminated by people who took them for putting them in terrariums. So, it's always a difficult question to answer, but surely we have to, to be attentive uh, to that. And of course, uh, Tadwick is very open, so if uh, the Korean colleague is interested, he's very welcome to participate. Okay, thank you. The next.